joy of Jesus this morning to the Mount Zion AME Zion Church at 455 West Fred G. Gray Avenue in Montgomery, Alabama. We pray that as you join us this morning, that you would worship the Lord with us in the spirit of holiness. Let us sing our hymn of praise this morning, hymn number 242. 246, Majesty.
This ends the reading of God's Word from Matthew, the 28th chapter, verses 8 through 20. God bless the readers, the hearers, and the doers of this holy writ. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer this morning. And there are those, of course, who are missing amongst us for various and sundry reasons. Let us remember them in prayer this morning. Let us remember this neighborhood this morning in our prayers. And those persons, if only we got a glimpse of them this week, we might not know their names, but perhaps you can remember their faces. Let us remember them in prayer this morning. Let us go to God. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. There is indeed none like you. Wherever we go, none can compare. Wherever we have been, there is still none like you. So we praise you this morning that you are God and you are God alone. We thank you this morning for your mercies, for they have not failed us. Even in our dark moments, you have shown your light of glory. We thank you, God, that even in despair, you are the lifter of our heads. We thank you this morning for allowing us this privilege to come before you with humble adoration, for you are great, and you are greatly to be praised. We thank you this morning, even with frail bodies, you allowed us to come before your presence. And you told us that we could come boldly, and in our time of need, we would find him. So we come with thankfulness on our hearts that you have not forgotten about us, even when we forget about you. Thank you for every angel that you have dispatched to protect us from hurt, harm, and danger. For it was by your hand that you have kept us. You've kept us from all the enemy has planned for us. But we thank you that your plans are to prosper us and not to harm us to give us hope, to give us peace. So we thank you that your plan outweighs whatever Satan has desired for us. Thank you, God, that just like you told your servant, you prayed for us. You've given us the compassion to pray for each other. Even though Satan would desire to sift us as feet, we thank you that you prayed for us. Thank you so much, God. So many wonderful blessings and so many more. Our lips cannot quite utter the things that you have done for us. The hymn writer said, Count your many blessings, name them one by one and see what the Lord has done. But if I could just name one, when I look back over my life and think about all that you've done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, thank God for saving me. Thank you for salvation this morning. Thank you for the blood of Jesus which covers us, which sustains us today, God. We pray this morning for grieving hearts. Thank you that you are still the lifter of our heads. For mothers and fathers who are burying children, the senseless gun violence. God, you told us what to do 
you and your word. Help us to not harden our hearts in times like these. Help us to be hands and feet that will bring peace to people who need you. We petition heaven today, God, for those who are frail in their bodies. Remind them that you are still the healer. You heal physical bodies. You heal minds. Grandmama said you are mind regulator. Thank you that you give peace to those who will keep their minds stayed on you. Thank you, Father, that you've lifted us from our burdens of despair. And that you're strengthening us. That when we are strengthened, others might be strengthened. Pray for those who are listening everywhere that you would do for them what they are unable to do for themselves today God you know every heart's desire even when we don't I'm so glad that you are omnipresent you're everywhere you hear your children's cries when we fall, you lift us up. Thank you, God. Pray today, God, that those who are listening would have ears to hear what thus saith the Lord. Whether it's through the reading of your word, the preaching of your word, or the singing of the song. Even on the stringed instruments. God, let your word fall upon our hearts today that we might be witnesses of God who is able to do anything but faith. Witnesses of God who is able to draw us near to him. God answers our prayers and then gives us the ability to tell others about God who sent his son Jesus to save us from our sin. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your miraculous healing power today, God. Because you are able to do anything but fail. Have thine own way in this place today as only you can. Do for us what we're unable to do for ourselves. And we're ever careful to give you the praise and the glory that is due your name. Hear our prayer today, God. Hear our prayer as only you can. Hear our prayer, blessed Savior. We need you in Jesus' name. Gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine.
your feet. Come on, let's sing the chorus. Let's sing the chorus with the choir. You are great, you do miracles so great. Come on. We know it's a true song. from the New King James Version. 
And it says, and as they went to tell his disciples, that is Mary Magdalene and the other women who were at the tomb early on Resurrection Sunday, Jesus met them saying, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Jesus met them and said, Rejoice. And that's what I want to preach about today. Rejoice. Everybody shout, Rejoice. Now, perhaps in the NIV, it might say greetings, or in another translation, it might say all hail. Uh, I like this New King James Version because uh, with emphasis, he said to them on Resurrection Sunday morning, rejoice. Jesus met Mary Magdalene and the other women who were with her, and those are his word that was his word to them before he commanded them to go tell the rest of the disciples to meet him in Galilee. Rejoice was sometimes in uh, Jesus' time a common day greeting. It was hello or greeting, but there is emphasis uh, in this passage when he met them on Resurrection Sunday morning. And certainly they had uh, more of a reason to call back their joy as they experienced the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who they had seen crucified. They saw him die. They saw him be buried. And now they are witnessing him uh, alive after three days, a partial of three days. And his word uh, to them immediately when he saw them was rejoice. I think that's a great word for us today. Uh, I hope you were listening to the songs. I was uh, thanking God because of how they were calling us in those songs to rejoice and to worship because no matter what's going on in life this command by Jesus uh, ought to be heard by the Christians wherever they are gathered and when they are not gathered every child of God has a reason to rejoice Somebody just whisper, rejoice. It was a big word. Call back your joy. When people are joyous, you see evidence. Is that true? Yes. When there is a joyousness in an individual, you experience something greater than you do when there isn't a joy in them. And Jesus says to the ladies who had been grieving, who were now startled and frightened because of the resurrection scene, he said to them, call your joy back. And that's what God wants to say to us today. Uh, call your joy back. In today's world where nations are always at war where the innocent suffer because of the greed of others and the selfish desire for control and supremacy, where disease and poverty are prevalent, where racism continues to raise its satanic head, where sexuality has become a major unresolved issue in society, where morality has been redefined without God's permission or blessing, where mass shootings are ever increasing, and politicians are sometimes playing politics on the people, where the rich get richer, the poorer get poorer, where the innocent are gunned down because of color or hate or fear or from being at a wrong house or wrong driveway or in a wrong car or opening a car door or in a wrong neighborhood or a wrong perception. Do you hear Jesus say? 
said to the church, but call back your joy. Don't allow the things that are uh, going on in the world to rob you of joy. Now, there's a distinction uh, that the scholars make between happiness and joy. Uh, joy can live inside of us. I'm told that happiness is something we experience from time to time and people can help make you happy or some people think some things can make them happy, awesome positions can make them happy, but joy is given by the Lord and it remains inside of us. And Jesus said, call back your joy. Let me ask you as a child of God, when is the last time you rejoice in the Lord? The Bible commands us in Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always and again I say, rejoice. Call back your joy. Yes, we're all experiencing some unfortunate things all of the time. Uh, somebody said to me, I, I don't know how you do this. You've got to deal with uh, bad stuff all the time. I refuse to allow anything that I'm dealing with to take my joy. I refuse to focus on the negative and forget about how good the Lord is. Come on. I refuse to allow the enemy to rob me of a satisfaction that I'm saved and I'm going to heaven and Jesus is on my side. I refuse to allow him to rob me of my joy. Whether it's in my own family, my church family, my neighborhood, my schoolmate, I refuse, somebody shout, I refuse to give up joy. Because if I give up my joy, I slip away into depression. If I give up my joy, my focus will change and I'll be negative. If I give up my joy, I will not function as a positive person for the kingdom of our God and our Christ. And so I will not let go of my joy. I will call my joy back when it looks like things are going bad. Come on. Pastor Paul says to the Philippian church, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I think it was David in Psalm 118 who simply said, this is the day that the Lord has made and I will somebody shall rejoice I will not rejoice because everything is going alright I will not rejoice because everybody likes me I will not rejoice because I'm happy with all the legislation that's being passed and trying to be passed I will not rejoice because I got enough money I will rejoice because God is in charge of this one. I will rejoice because Jesus died to save me. I will rejoice because when I didn't want him, he wanted me. Come on. I got a reason to rejoice because God is still in charge. Somebody shout, I will rejoice. I will rejoice. Got to lose loved ones, yeah, but I'm still going to rejoice because the Bible says the saints belong to him. And how precious the Bible says in the sight of God is the death of his saints, not my saints. So when the saints go on to be with the Lord, I remind myself in my tears, I know they're yours anyway, God. Help me to cope because I know it's all right with me. He says to these ladies who have been weeping for three days, who have been afraid uh, for three days, and who are now startled and frightened because they are looking at angels, men that they've never seen before, he said to them, rejoice. You can call your joy back now, rejoice. Look at the reasons as I quickly answer. Well, number one, you can rejoice because Jesus is always alive now. You know, sometimes we talk to 
that the Lord is still dead. Now, I don't mean to talk about you, talk about it. Talk. He's not being negative about it. He's trying to help us get something. When we're going through things, remember, Jesus is not going through. And he is not dead. He's alive. How many of you believe he's alive? The difference in who we are and who we would be is he's alive. I like the, the, the lyrics of, of the hymn that we sing, the hymnologist said, the, the grave has lost or death has lost its prey. <laughs> I like that. So the hymn writer said, death thought it had Jesus. Yeah. And, and the grave thought it had Jesus. Uh, I've always I've told you the story, but it's been 10 or 15 years, so you've forgotten it by now. Uh, Alma Scipio and Doris Patterson are sisters, and their uncle told this story. The late F. D. Mayweather, presiding elder uh, in the Birmingham area. And Dr. Mayweather tells this comical story about Jesus being alive. Now, you didn't get this one out of the Bible, but there is some connection with passages in the Bible, so don't miss this. He says that uh, uh, death had uh, entered Jesus, he had died, and uh, they buried him. Dr. Mayweather says that the devil, Brother Bay, threw a party. And said the devil and him were just having a, a good time in hell. Said we got him now. <laughs> said we got him now. But say uh, uh, after a couple of days, there was a knock at the door in hell. Said we all at the door. <laughs> said there was a knock at the door in hell, and and uh, it went to the door. Demon went to the door and said, "Who is it?" And he said, "This is Jesus." Said the devil, the demon went back and said to Satan, uh, we've got a problem. So what's the problem? Said he said, uh, somebody's at the door and he said his name is Jesus. He said, well, you know it's not Jesus. We killed him on Friday. <laughs> and we buried, buried him Friday afternoon and we put him in the grave and the grave has him so you know it can't be Jesus at the door. Somebody's playing tricks. Go back to the door. Went back to the door and said, uh, who is it? He said, open the door and you'll see my name is Jesus. And he said, he opened the door and the Lord, the risen Lord was standing there. He said, well, what can we do for you? And Dr. Mayweather says, Jesus responded, tell Satan I've come to get the keys now. <laughs> I said, I got everything else. I said, I tell him, I'm coming to get the keys of hell, death, and the grave. Tell him I'm alive now. For him, Lord, listen, as children of God, uh, paramount in our minds, at the apex of our thinking, ought to be Jesus is always alive. Yes, yes. Somebody shout, thank you, Jesus. Cemetery is full of dead folk, but you can't find Jesus yet stone out there. One day mine will be somewhere if the Lord tarries, but Jesus won't be out there. Hallelujah. The second thing uh, Jesus says rejoice because Jesus is always available to you. How many of you know he's always available? Now listen to people. I know sometimes you can't get the answer that you are requesting. But write it down, that doesn't mean Jesus is unavailable. Sometimes you don't need the answer you are requesting. Can I tell you something else? Sometimes you don't even want the answer you're requesting. But Jesus is available always to his children. Look at the Bible. He's always available when Mary Magdalene and the women were in need of seeing the resurrected 
and Savior. What did he do? He didn't wait till they got home. He met them while they were hurrying away from the tomb because they needed to know the man was alive. When Mary Magdalene, the Bible says, John chapter 20, uh, must have come back to the tomb and was standing outside of the tomb, crying her eyes out. Jesus, standing behind her, made himself available to Mary in her sorrow and called her name, Mary. And because she knew his voice, she turned around thinking first that he was a gardener and said to Jesus, if you know where they have laid him, tell me so I can go get him and so she can carry him by herself. And when Jesus called her Mary, she turns around and realizes he was available to her. He was already there. How many of you have gone along in life and you thought you would by yourself be discovered the Lord was already walking with you? The Lord was already there. He was already available to you. When Cleophas and his friend were walking the Emmaus Road, Jesus just caught up and walked with them and they discovered later that evening that he was available to them. When the ten disciples had locked themselves into their homes together because they were afraid of the religious leading Jew, the Bible says Jesus just came inside the walls with the doors and the windows shut to let them know I'm alive and I'm available. I like the fact that Jesus is always available. Now, you're asking me, well, Reverend Shuba, does that mean every time you pray, you hear from me? Absolutely not. But I, I, I walk with him long enough now to know I don't have to hear him every time I pray. He hears me. And, and the sunlight is right. And he walks with me. When he needs to talk to me, he talks to me. And if I can't hear him voice in the still quiet voice, I pick up the Bible because he talks to me in the Bible. He's always available. You don't know anybody that's always available. Even if you love them with all your heart, they're not always available. Sometimes I'm trying to make contact with Mrs. Shufrey. I have little common threats as if I'm going to do something. Turn to somebody and say, he's not going to do a thing. All that stuff he's talking is just play play stuff. So I'm gonna turn your phone off. <laughs> Nobody's always available. And she retorts to me. You don't always ask immediately when I call you, and you know what happens then, right? I have to share that with going on something else. Because nobody can always be available. 24 hours a day, except Jesus. Come on, some of you have experienced that. You try to get your best friend, trying to get your spouse, trying to get your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, and you didn't get them, and you, you were having a little hissy for nothing. The good news is, remember Jesus is listening to you every time you speak. Every time you pray, he hears you because he's available. Isn't it uh, aggravating when you know you got a little money in the bank, you got your ATM card, you got your access code, and you go to the bank and you look at the screen and it says, unavailable right now. <laughs> I mean, you've done that before. And you just get upset and you talk to the screen, and talk to the bank and nobody's there listening to you. Look at folks laughing because they did it before. Because then you got to go to another bank and take your little self on where you're going. No, nothing is always available. Good news, Jesus says to them, you can rejoice because I am always somebody shall available. I'm available in storms, and the Bible shows him showing up in the storm. I'm available in sickness, and the Bible shows him showing up in sickness. I'm available in sorrow, and the Bible shows Jesus showing up in sorrow. I'm available in every situation, and the Bible shows him showing up regardless of what people 
will experience, Jesus will just show up and be available for them. So we live with the comfort. He says, rejoice because I'm always alive, but also rejoice because I'm always available. Because if I'm alive and I'm available, that won't get you too far. But then he says, rejoice because Jesus is always able to change you. Oh, I like that. I wish I had written down the things that people said to me would not happen. I wish I had written down the things that I thought weren't going to happen. <laughs> I wish I knew the things that you have said would not happen. And then the Lord changed. Isn't that something? He is able to change anything. I like it. I like the Lord. I like it because he's always making people look stupid and foolish who try to play God. Who want to say what God's not going to do. Don't you understand? Nobody can share that position with God. God does whatever. That there's a man who came to me and said, I want you to pray for me because the Lord told me to do something and it's dangerous. And he told me what it was. I said, you sure the Lord told you to do that? That man is in this sanctuary this morning. I'll tell you who he is, but you got to give me $10,000 first. <laughs> it was a good thing. It was a godly thing, but it was a dangerous thing. And I said to him, are you sure God told you to do that? He said, Reverend Shuba, don't try to talk me out of what I know the Lord has convicted me to do. He said, I just came by for you to pray that God will keep me in his way as I obey him. And I shut up and prayed for him. And God was able to do exactly what he told that man to do. Do you hear me? It does not matter whether you doubt it, whether you can't see it, whether you don't understand or comprehend. Maybe it's not for you to comprehend or understand. Just know that Jesus is able to change things. He can do, Apostle Paul says in the Philippian Ephesians rather, he can do exceedingly and abundantly above what you can ask or could see. Isn't that awesome? Turn to somebody and tell them you can't even think of the stuff the Lord can do. You can't even conceive it because he's so much greater than what we have a capacity to think. He can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask. Turn to somebody and tell them you can't even ask him for all the stuff that he can do. He's able, so he say, just rejoice. Somebody shout rejoice. He can open doors and folks say never would be open. Rejoice because he's able to do it. I know some people said it wasn't going to happen, but rejoice because he was able to do it and he did. Yes. Hmm. Somebody else was trying, uh, was applying for a position, eminently qualified had the best credentials, but the devil got busy. A person noticed that some things that they had submitted were no longer in their file. But God would always put them in the right place at the right time. So if the file was changed, they could put the information back in the file. If somebody took it out in an effort to make sure they didn't get the job, God just would alert them in time. I'm talking about his ability now. And, and he moved in all kinds of mysterious and strange ways. And what they thought had been removed was already back there. And the person got that promotion. Come on, talk to me. The Lord is able to do exceedingly and abundantly. And sometimes church folks, Including, I hate to say this, Reverend Ware, including preachers, 
tried to play God. Preachers said to me when I was in my twenties, what wouldn't happen for me? Boy, aren't they baffled that I'm still here? They talked about how I could not be promoted, how I could not be blessed for being a champion for justice and standing up for what was right and being vocal. If nothing else happens to me, as I tell my students all the time, man, I've been blessed. I've had a great life in ministry. Hadn't done everything that I wanted to do. But if I died today, I'd be happy. Can you say that? And they told me what wasn't going to happen, but they weren't looking at one thing. They were looking at me. They were not looking at Jesus. Hallelujah. How many of you testify that he has done what people didn't think was going to happen? Hallelujah. How many of you can testify that this trumpet broke you off the door and said, Oh no, I broke that. Amen. Because he's able to do anything. So he said to these women, You can rejoice because I've already come to death and the grave, and I'm alive forevermore. Do you realize that there was no other founder? in the world that can say that after 100 years, and we're talking about 2,000 now, every founder of any faith group after 100 years is now dead. And Jesus is alive after 2,000 years. Somebody shout me, that man is able, he's able. I'm concluding with this. He says rejoice in him. Uh, he's always alive, he's always available, he's always able to change it. And then I'm um, concluded because he's always with his disciples. He's always beside us, right beside us. That's hard to imagine. I know because sometimes people get mad at the Lord because they didn't do what they wanted him to do. But let's not confuse your will with his will. Sometimes we want what God is unwilling to do. I've lived with that. I'm a pastor. I've had to bury people that I didn't want to bury. I've had to say farewell to folks that I wanted uh, God to let live. But I always understand. I try to keep a good theological perspective that that God is God and I'm just a sinner. And so sometimes God is going to do things that the servant doesn't want to happen. He's going to allow things that the servant would not have allowed to happen, but he's smarter than the servant. He knows we sing it, but we sometimes don't believe it, but we sing it. He knows what's best for me. Even though my weary eyes, they cannot but he knows what's best for me. And, and, and so you gotta live with that. And while he knows what's best for me, and sometimes that means leaving me in the storm longer than I want to be in the storm, or allowing me to be pestered or bothered by my adversary longer than I want to be pestered or bothered by my adversary, he knows what's best for me. Or not making a way when I wanted him to make a way, but he knows what's best for me. And so he says, rejoice because I'm with you even if I don't do that. That takes some faith, that it? I didn't do what you wanted me to do, but I'm still with you. Now the best illustration I can give you is the illustration of being a parent, of being a daddy, a father to three children. I've never given them everything they asked me. I don't think any other man here did that. If he did, stand up. You gave your child everything. I'm talking to the men. I'm not going to bother you, ladies. Talk to the men right now. If, if you're a man and you gave your child everything they asked you, stand up so we can give you a hand. 
And then so we can pray for you at the altar when you finish, because we know you're going to be alive. <laughs> Isn't that right, anyway? But because I didn't give them everything they asked, it never meant one day that I was not with them. It never meant a day that I went without loving them to the core. It never meant one day that I would not have given my life instantly for my children. Not a second. Because regardless of what they think, I'm always there. Absent or present. Doing right, doing wrong. Listening to me, not listening to me. I'm always with them because those are my children. And I hear the Lord say, you can rejoice because I'm always with you. Ooh, that shouting stuff there. You can rejoice because I'm with you even to the end of the world. Even when you're wrong, the Lord say, I'm not going to leave you. When you misunderstand me, I'm with you. When you fail to do what I told you to do, I'm with you. When you're going through your surgery, I'm with you. When I don't rescue you, I'm still on the boat with you. When I do come through for you, I'm with you. I'm with you always, every day of your life. And he says to these women, rejoice. And I hear him saying, to the Christian church, you can rejoice. The world has gone haywire. But when you read the Bible, the world was always haywire. So much so, in one passage in Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says, the earth was so corrupt that, it, that God repented that he had even made it. So it was so messed up and wickedness was so, so, so prevalent everywhere. God looked, God said, oh my goodness, I have made this. Just go over and read this in the Bible. I told you it's a big book in town. But yet, when God sent the great flood, afterward, God put a rainbow in the sky and said, I'm not going to do that anymore because I love my creation. And God promised to be with us. So you got a reason to rejoice. Yeah, but Reverend Schubert, you're not going through what I'm going through. No, I'm not. But does that, does that change the fact Jesus is alive? Does that change the fact that Jesus is available to you? Does that change the fact that Jesus is able? To see you through whatever you're going through? Does that change the fact that Jesus is always with you even when you're in pain or disappointment or sorrow? It does not. So Jesus says, rejoice. Call back your joy. Don't live in the agony. Don't live. Don't allow depression to slip in. You got to talk to yourself. You got to call your, your joy back yourself. You got it. You say it, right? You got to remember what the Lord has done. So you rejoice even if you're in the lion's den. Or if you're on the mountain bleak or on the road and sea. You rejoice because Jesus is with you. Sometimes that's all I have. But I discovered Nelson Henry III, that's all I needed, was to remember the Lord has not left me. He promised to be with you always. So you could be sopping tears for breakfast, or sopping tears for dinner, or sopping tears in the midnight hour. The Lord said, I'm right there with you. I'm in your soul. And whatever else you're going through. Father, I give you thanks today. We 
always have a reason to rejoice. Sometimes we're looking for the wrong things. Sometimes we're expecting the wrong people to bring us joy rather than to accept what you have already done and what you have promised us. And so today I simply ask you help us to rejoice to call back our joy because we're children of the Almighty God and there is nobody like you in the name of Jesus please stand to your feet as Reverend Jones makes the invitation today we know that Jesus is still alive, alive and well. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is that day to understand that He is available to you. Today. 
Amen and amen. Go with God and go in His presence.